Hello and welcome to our webinar. Sorry for a short delay. We uh, there was a little bit of technical challenge, but uh, we are overcame that, and now we can get started. So I'm going to call this uh, webinar Angular 2: A One-Year Retrospective, and uh, this may seem like a slightly odd uh, title, but the, the the reason is that actually um, is is uh, as I was preparing for this uh, webinar, I started thinking to events a little bit over a year ago when we really started uh, at Rangel getting very serious about um, Angular 2. So in particular in May 2015 we really uh, we, it was a little bit after coming back from NGConf that year we started really thinking very seriously about Angular 2. We started also at that point really talking quite widely about what we thought would, would be a, a proper um, Angular 2 transition strategy. So in particular I, I gave a talk uh, in May 2015 that got a fairly uh, decent amount of audience and um, we've, we've talked, so in this talk we talked about quite a few things in terms of how can, what, what to expect from Angular 2, what uh, your transition strategy could be and so on. And so now fast forward to last week, last week we finally have an announcement that Angular 2, the 2.0 version is, is actually out and so we can all start using it now, except for, well, we've been actually using it for quite a while by now. So this puts, uh, you know, it becomes actually odd, even though it's just released, it's also a good uh, time for a little bit of a reflection. So at Rangel.io, uh, and as you probably know, we are a consulting company. We work a lot with Angular as well as uh, other uh, front-end frameworks. We do a lot of front-end work as well as um, some full stack work. So in June last year, we actually ran some numbers to just see what frameworks were our developers working on. This is all of the people who are working on the front end. And this is the numbers we, we got at the time. This was June. So we actually had 52% uh, of our developers working on uh, Angular 2 projects at the time. Uh, we had about 27% uh, working on Angular 1, and we had about 21% React. Now, we haven't had a chance to run the same numbers more recently, but my guess that come October, our numbers are going to actually look roughly like this. Right? We expect to have a total of two developers working on Angular 1 projects, uh, a vastly expanded number of people working on Angular 2 projects, and uh, as well as a somewhat growing uh, number of developers working on React. So this kind of puts us in a kind of a good position, uh, position to reflect on what's been happening. So what I want to do today is I want to talk a bit about some of the things that really kind of over the course of this year worked out more or less as expected. And then I'll talk a bit about some of the things that actually turned out a little bit different, so things that surprised us along the way. So let's talk first about what worked out more or less as we expected it. And the number one thing is the idea of components. I mean, Angular 2 brought us the promise. I mean, last year we got a promise that Angular 2 is going to be all about components, and uh, the framework that we got really is that way, which is uh, pretty amazing. So this is, in that sense, actually not that different from React. And, um, from that perspective, there's a lot of people who might have uh, grown a little bit impatient with Angular 1 and uh, who um, were sort of not really comfortable jumping into Angular 2 while it was in beta. And consequently, I know a lot of developers did start working on uh, investing in React. Well, I mean, now is actually kind of a, a good time for, for those people to consider coming back because uh, Angular 2 is actually very similar to React in many good ways, uh, though it also has some ways where it's different, where it's, it's uh, in this uh, innovation in particular, one of the things uh, we've seen is that it's somewhat more uh, performant than uh, React, uh, that even than React, not, not to complain about performance in React too much. And uh, so let's look, look quickly about um, why this is important, this, this focus on components, which is something that Angular 2 and React both share. So first, just a bit of history so that we're all on the same page, right? So in Angular, we all started, well, some of us started with Angular 1 uh, kind of back in the day, you know, uh, 2013 or so, we were doing sort of Angular 1 classic, what I call Angular 1 classic development. 
And that really means that we write our code as a bunch of code that communicate heavily through dollar scope. And it's something that sort of seemed like a good idea at the time when, when we got started on this. And it became fairly clear very quickly that there were serious limitations to this approach. Right? And the main limitation is that basically you've got a bunch of controllers that all uh, communicating through this shared, effectively shared, nested, but and, and somewhat hierarchical, but still shared global object, uh, which is the sort of the network, the system of scopes, and um, it becomes really messy because you kind of never know why your component is presenting the value that it's presenting, and uh, because something else modified it, and it just kind of gets a little bit messy. So later uh, in uh, the sort of Angular life cycle, in Angular 1 sort of history, a lot of developers moved to what I call late Angular 1. And late Angular 1 is really trying to be more componentized. It's uh, using controller as first and then switching to component directives. And all of this uh, in taking a lot of sort of inspiration from component-oriented uh, design. And this can be done well. Uh, but there are sort of two challenges. I mean, first of all, it takes a lot of discipline to implement a proper componentized approach with uh, Angular 1. Uh, again, with discipline, you could do a lot of it, but it takes a lot of that discipline. And the second is that you get, if you kind of apply the discipline, you get no performance. Uh, you don't get much in terms of performance um, reward for this, right? Uh, and this is something that we'll see is different with Angular 2, where you get this reward, you, you get rewarded for your discipline, among other things, in terms of performance. And now, meanwhile, you know, this is like with last year, the components are all the rage in React, and um, you know, some of us feel you know, like we wish there was a better way of doing it in Angular. And so the good news is that Angular 2 really has put components at the center. So the component-oriented design is, 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 is when, you, when you jump into Angular 2, that's what you want to be doing. That, that's, that's, the, that's the reason for you to be adopting Angular 2, is that you can actually really fully, properly implement component-oriented architecture. So now let me talk a little bit about components. I've used the word a few times, but just what do I mean by component-oriented uh, design? So here is an, uh, an image of a date picker from uh, YUI, a library from 1982. Uh, so the way in the sort of Angular 1 world, the way this component might potentially work is that it basically has access to dollar scope, uh, through dollar scope to the system of scopes, and it goes and modifies values on it when it feels it's appropriate, and then sort of while a bunch of other controllers are doing the same thing. Uh, in a sort of in a proper kind of component-oriented architecture, you would want to implement to implement you would want to implement this date picker as a component, which really means that you constrain the interface to it uh, to just two things: there's inputs and there are outputs. So your inputs in this case would would be values that get set from outside of the component by its owner. So the owner, for instance, that says this component should open now. Uh, may provide, for instance, the pre-selected date and some options. Right? Maybe it tells you, the, the owner tells you which uh, days should be holidays and some of the others. So it, it gives you some information as it can also then potentially set some of those values further down the line. Now, and the second thing is that your component will have outputs. And outputs are really events. So basically when things happen inside of the component that it wants uh, the uh, its owner to be notified about it fires an event. So in this case, then probably uh, the main event is going to be the selection of the new date, and then your uh, par your owner, your parent, can subscribe to that event. Right? And then the, and the idea is that as far as communication between your component and its uh, parents, that's it. Right? Your component does not have access to any sort of uh, global data structures. It does not have access to any sort of shared scopes. It really communicates. It takes its inputs through the inputs uh, that it defines, and it sends out signals through outputs. It may also have optionally an internal state, but will that state would be transient, which is to say that if this component is destroyed and is recreated uh, with this architecture, it's kind of the responsibility of the parent to 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 provide the component, the newly created component, with the information it needs. Uh, the component doesn't sort of get to store uh, data, which actually simplifies this transient statelessness. Uh, statefulness actually makes your life a lot, a lot easier when it comes to debugging things. 
So and here's how you would use a component like that in an Angular 2 application. So let's say we're going to, uh, so this component is going to have a name, as a select Angular 2 calls it the selector. So in this case, the selector would be called, for instance, funky date picker. And in, so we use this kind of as a directive in Angular 1, uh, or for that matter, as we would with HTML element. Uh, and inside, as attributes, we specify an expression that will control our inputs and also a, a callback that's going to be executed on when the output event happens. So in this case, we'll say uh, if selected date is a variable in our template scope, we'll, specify, we'll set the selected date input by putting selected date in brackets and it says equals the expression in this case is the selected date variable. Uh, and then in order to subscribe to the new uh, uh, to the new change uh, to the change event, in this case the date selection, we'll put new date selection in parentheses and rate equals to and uh, specify the the, co the code that is to be executed. Now the neat thing here is that if you remember in Angular 1, there was a lot of uh, kind of ng click, ng whatever directives. Like you, you had to learn you know, a few dozen of them. Angular 1 instead actually gives us a really simple syntax and very simple, uh, consistent way of, of doing all of this. Like we have inputs and we have outputs. We set our inputs using the uh, bracket notation, as in, like here we put brackets around selected date, and you always do that, right? Like whenever you want to set input on a component, or for that matter, if you want to set input on a HTML element, on a DOM element, you just use uh, brackets, and whenever you want to subscribe to an event, uh, you use the parenthesis notation. So you put that event name in the parenthesis, and then you specify the expression, and this is how you subscribe to that. It's actually, if you, Kind of one, it's easy to remember, right? Because you can think of the uh, brackets you know, here representing kind of setting a value in a dictionary, and uh, you could think of the parentheses as kind of referring to the function, which is like you're subscribing to uh, an event. You're, you're going to be subscribing a function to uh, attaching a function as a callback to an event. So what does this all give us? Well, it gives us a few amazing things. One is modularity, right? So your components are now isolated, which means that you kind of don't really have to worry so much about why stuff is misbehaving, right? Because uh, your component can't go and just reach out into random parts of your application and mess things up. So if you're having problems in your application, you sort of know how to isolate and be confident that it's not your component that's causing that. The second thing is reuse, right? You can reuse this component anywhere because it's actually completely um, agnostic of the context it was used. It just expects certain inputs and it fires certain events, right? And so it doesn't make any assumptions about where it appears under the scope hierarchy. And uh, the third is the ease of refactoring, right? So because now that you can be fairly confident that your component is subscribed to very sort of narrow, uh, simple interface, you can go ahead and actually change how this component works and as long as the events, uh, the interface stays the same, you actually can expect that you're not going to break things. So that's great too. And finally, there is an, this approach introduces opportunities for performance optimization. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but the main idea is that because your application has this much more uh, logical structure, you could actually then tell Angular when to update your component, when not to update your component. And it allows Angular 2 to really short circuit a lot of work. Right? Instead of going and checking, like in Angular 1, we have this, uh, you know, the kind of uh, digest cycle where basically it just goes and checks everything and what changed, what else changed, now that we change that thing. In Angular 2, you could short circuit a lot of this, especially if you actually make a certain additional commitments. Uh, about your components, and I'll talk about those in a second. So the other thing is that when thinking about components, it's important to think not just about like date pickers and things like that, but really um, think of it as like components all the way down. Right? So when we look at this date picker, I mean, it's like everyone's like, well, obviously that, that's a component, right? But you could think, well, this date picker consists of the header part and then the bottom month display. So the month display is a component, and then this month consists of each row, that's a component, 
And then down the line, there is the individual cell, and that's a component. And if you really go and break up your component into really small ones, and in our work, we've been really breaking them up in a very, very tiny color, like components, and you make a fairly sizable collection of them, then it gives you massive opportunities for code reuse. It really helps you with modularity. It makes it a lot easier for you to understand your code. So you could go ahead and actually, if your cell is not in, a, in, a, in, in your component not behaving, you could go and actually change the behavior of that cell without worrying about messing up the rest of your component. And that just makes your life much, much easier. So the other thing that we've been, that Tango we've been talking about for uh, well over a year now is uh, unidirectional data flow. Now, if you remember, so in, in Angular uh, 1, again, so the first, our, uh, the first approach that a lot of us used was to, to store our application state using the, the dollar scope uh, hierarchy. Now, mercifully, dollar scope is gone from Angular 2, and the reason is because, I mean, using dollar scope, I think we've all come to an understanding that this was sort of a bad idea, and, uh, and it's gone from Angular 2, and it's not going to be missed, hopefully, by anyone. Now, the second strategy, you could say the second best strategy or second worst strategy, I guess it's middle out of the three that I'm going to talk about, is uh, in Angular 1 would be a service-based uh, state management, which is to say that you uh, rely on the fact that you have your services in Angular and they're singletons, and so you could have, um, you could take your application state and split it into different services, and you uh, can still give your um, components kind of, you let them bring in uh, services as they need them, you now no longer share like everything, but you still have uh, those smaller chunks of your state now available kind of in a read-write manner, and because they are uh, singletons, it does still mean that when your one component changes the state, the other components will hopefully change, you know, will, will potentially see that, but this sort of, it creates a little bit of ambiguity about what's going to happen there, and it also creates the possibility where your component, again, is displaying some data that it got from the service, but you don't really know why the service has that data because, and it's possible that, well, there's some other component that's setting it and you really don't know how it ended up being that way. So now, again, this approach is vastly better than the old dollar scope approach and um, it's used by a lot of people. This is kind of where uh, Angular, uh, for a lot of people, that's where Angular 1 development sort of ended up being at. And this approach is still an option in Angular 2. So if you really want to do that, you could do that. So we recommend, generally speaking, against that approach. Instead, uh, for us, the approach that's really been winning uh, the, the battle is, uh, is Flux. And so Flux has originated, um, originated in the React community. And then about a year ago, uh, I guess what, June or so uh, last year, the React community have really sort of settled on Redux as the most popular um, implementation of Flux. But, uh, we've talked a lot before about Flux and Redux, so I'm not going to um, talk here again about these uh, the, the many advantages of that approach. Uh, but the main, uh, again, the main idea is that you don't have offer a read-write access to your state from your components. Instead, your components emit actions uh, that go through a system of reducers, and then your components subscribe to uh, to updates uh, on, uh, on of the state uh, after it has gone through those reducers. Uh, it's, it's, it simplifies vastly your architecture. It makes it very easy to just adopt the same architecture from the beginning. Now, in terms of how you do that in Angular 2, well, you've got two solutions those days. Uh, for using this. Uh, one approach is uh, NG2 Redux, and so this is something that uh, a project that we at Tangle have actually been actively involved with uh, in, in terms of moving it forward. Um, and the second one is, and, and NG2 Redux really allows you to just use straight up Redux. I mean, it's the same Redux library as you would have been using in React, but you now bring it uh, to Angular. I mean, basically, Redux itself is uh, independent of framework. There is a bridge library called uh, React Redux that connects it to React, and so this is similar. NG2 Redux brings uh, your Redux into Angular 2. 
The second option is uh, NGRX Store. NGRX Store is uh, a little bit different. It's a more of an Angular-oriented re-implementation uh, of, uh, of Redux. So it's, it's, it's effectively the implementation of the same pattern uh, in, in a somewhat more Angular-centric way. So I mean, there's some advantages and disadvantages to both. I'm not going to get today into the pros and cons of each, but what I would sort of ask, advise everyone to do is to pick one or the other. I mean, whichever one you use, just use some Redux or some variation on Redux, such as NGRX. Either one would vastly uh, simplify your architecture when it comes to Angular 2. So uh, the other thing is, uh, I guess, a year ago, we, uh, when we started looking very actively into uh, Angular 2, one of the sort of things about it was a little unusual was using TypeScript, uh, or for that matter, ES6. And on that front, the most amazing thing is just how far we've gone as a community in the last year. Right? I mean, a year ago, it was still, there was still uncertainty about whether everyone should be adopting ES6 right away and how the right way to do, do it and what are the advantages of and disadvantage of transpilers and which transpilers and at this point it's like feels to us that this question is settled like everyone should be using uh, ES6 and or TypeScript. Now again a year ago ES6 uh, and TypeScript had a, a big overlap but neither one was really a subset of the other. Today TypeScript is strictly a superset of ES6 so when I say TypeScript that includes all of ES6. Um, one exciting thing is um, was to there was like a year ago there was a lot of um, indecision about whether Webpack or JSPM which one is which one to use. Uh, today we feel like Webpack is uh, has really emerged as the winner, so we really uh, advise everyone to use Webpack. Webpack is awesome. Uh, and then there's been an interesting thing in how uh, TypeScript and Babel has really just divided along community lines. Uh, at this point, I think it's really not uh, kind of pointless to argue about advantages and disadvantages of TypeScript versus Babel. It's really very simple. If you're using Angular 2, you should be using TypeScript. And if you're using React, you probably should be using Babel. Uh, you, because, because all of the tooling in each of the uh, ecosystems is really oriented towards the, uh, the transpiler that uh, that ecosystem has sort of settled on. In case of Angular 2, it's TypeScript. So, I mean, like, really, if you're using Angular 2, do yourself a favor and jump into TypeScript. And uh, one last thing I wanted to mention is the uh, is decorators. I mean, one of the cool things of TypeScript that really wasn't available, or still, strictly speaking, isn't available in ES6, is decorators. Um, though they're coming to ES6, uh, or they're coming to uh, ES2017. Now, I want to do a shout out. We, uh, one of our um, developers here, Michael Bennett, did an amazing talk at NGConf last uh, this year uh, called Demystifying Decorators. And he talked about how, how to understand how decorators actually work. Because oftentimes when people look at decorators, they think decorators are kind of magical. And they're not. You can actually implement your own decorators, and it's not really that complicated. And we've been doing this in our own projects. And when you start actually implementing your own uh, TypeScript decorators, you get a lot of, there's a lot of neat things that you would want to do. So I would really urge everyone to go and actually uh, listen to that talk. This was at um, NGCon uh, this year. So now with all of putting all of this together, let me go quickly over an example of a component in Angular 2. So we, uh, so here's how an Angular 2 component looks like. I mean, first of all, that would strike you is that this is uh, ES6 slash TypeScript code with decorators. So if you've been uh, looking at ES6 and in particular decorators, then everything here would sort of immediately start making sense. If you're new to ES6, then this probably looks like an entirely different programming language. So what we do here is we start with an import statement. And so which is to say that we actually have now a proper uh, module system, right? Like not, you know, there was, a sort of, there, was, there, was, there was an Angular had a module system that it kind of worked for us, uh, lacking a proper module system. But now ES6 has that. So really, uh, when you work with Angular 2, you would be leveraging ES6 modules very heavily. So in this case, we have, we import four specific uh, symbols from uh, Angular 2 core. 
And uh, we define our component as a class. Right? Now, if you've been working with controller as, this is actually not that different, right? because you're already kind of used to conceptually your component, uh, your, your, your controller as being a class. So if you've been doing directives using controller as. So inside of this class, now we're using TypeScript, so we get to declare private variables. And those uh, variables, uh, in this case, are count and result. So count is going to be a value that gets set from outside the object, and the result is going to be the way that we're going to communicate to our parent that stuff has uh, happened. And so the way we communicate that is using the uh, decorators. Right? So the way uh, we, we put the at input uh, decorator in front of count, and this would allow Angular to, to figure out that this is something that's going to get exposed to, um, to the parent as a value that they can set. The This is something that uh, they can go that 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 your know, template can go ahead and subscribe and expect uh, and an event so they can event with a handler. So in this case, we're actually going to go and make our uh, output an event emitter, which is to say that it's going to be a uh, uh, it's going to be a stream effectively. Right? So every time we um, have a, a new value that we want to send out, we are going to basically emit it through that stream and then our parent can subscribe to that. So, um, and then before that whole class, we have the large at component decorator. And this provides a whole, whole bunch of metadata information about our uh, component. So in particular, uh, here we just have two main pieces. We specify the uh, name of that component, which is going to counter. That's the name under which it's going to become available. So we don't really do like with directives, there was sort of a bit of magic substitution between what directive is called versus how it's going to appear. Here we actually make this explicit. We're going to call this lowercase counter. That's going to be our selector. And we also provide uh, a template. Now the neat thing with the template, again, this is the feature of ES6, is that we have uh, uh, long uh, document strings, right? So we can basically specify a multi-line string with a text symbol. And so it makes it a lot easier for us to actually specify a template inside of uh, our component file. So we've got it all neatly packaged together. Uh, inside of the template, you will see that some of the things are similar. This is the, the way the count value is included is actually very similar to how this works with uh, Angular 1 with the double curly brackets. And then here we're using the uh, parenthesis uh, notation to subscribe to the click event of the button that we've included in our component. Now the neat thing here is that button is not actually an Angular component. A button is a, just a native DOM thing. Uh, but we actually use the same method to, for subscribing to button events as we would to our component events. Right? There is a, that parenthesis notation actually works all the way through and that makes life a lot easier. We no longer have to remember sort of all of the ng clicks and things like that. So to complicate that example a little bit, let's add, uh, let me add an element of change detection strategy. So if you do, again, in Angular 1, you basically need to have this whole strategy for figuring out, well, what, did stuff change and should your update, uh, you know, should your component display be updated? And this is quite inefficient. So in Angular 2, we actually have, interestingly, a lot of flexibility as to how our component react to stuff that potential to potential changes right and so one of them is um, in particular so when our component is provided through an input with an object that may be a fairly complicated data structure what would our component how would our component know when there are pieces of that object that have changed right so, so by default it will go and actually be sort of watching the that object and see that something changed this can become really really inefficient so as an, in order to guard ourselves from that inefficiency, Angular 2 gives us several, a number of change detection strategies. And the most exciting one is uh, on push. And on push basically means that we say that for, this in, for the inputs provided to this component, we are going to assume that they are immutable. So if we are provided with an, with an object, if our inputs is set to an object, we're going to assume 
that nothing in, about that object is going to change. So if, if the value is somewhere down in that object changes, we are not going to pay attention to this. Instead, we will only update our, in particular, it means that we're not going to propagate this uh, update further down. Okay? So instead, we're going to expect to the, for the object to be completely replaced. And when the object is replaced, when we really got our input set to an entirely new object, then we'll say, oh, now we actually need to go ahead and rewrite the things. This is, in our experience, this has been a massive, massive, massive uh, change in performance. Right? This is like, you know, when people say that Angular 2 is more performant, in most cases, what they really mean is that Angular 2 can be vastly, vastly more performant when you properly use on push change detection. So now let me talk briefly about a few surprises along the way. This is things that we didn't really quite expect a year ago, and then they were sort of caught us a bit by surprise. One of them is uh, we got contacted by the Angular team to uh, with a request to work on Angular Augury, what with what became eventually Angular Augury, which was uh, tools for debugging, and uh, we've um, had, um, here's uh, one of our developers, Vanessa Yuan, presenting this uh, at uh, NGConf last year. So that was a pretty awesome experience for us and uh, just a way for us to give back uh, to the community. Now, we've talked about Angular Augury before. We have prior webinars recorded on this, so I'm going to dwell on this, but that's been for us probably one of the most exciting um, examples. Now, other one, uh, surprise, was NativeScript, right? So, uh, Around a year ago, the React community sort of had this big, uh, very positive thing when React Native came on board. And uh, it really, in many ways, presented kind of the best of both worlds, which is basically being able to use native components in JavaScript. Right? So we've, we've worked a lot with uh, Cordova before. And with Cordova, you get, a, you get a lot in terms of being able to build. You get a lot in terms of being able to build uh, applications that run on the phone and can look pretty close to native, or at least very, very native-like. Uh, and you build them using JavaScript and DOM technologies, right? Uh, and this, and those applications can be made to be very performant. It's a bit of a, of a challenge sometimes to make them that performant. Uh, took us a lot of uh, research to figure out how to make ours performant. So, and there's always a kind of this quest for real sort of butter smoothness of true native components. Well, React Native brought that to uh, to React, which basically the idea there is that you really are using real native components. There is no DOM. There's really just native components, but you script them using uh, JavaScript. But again, without any without the compilation step, you're not compiling JavaScript to native. It's really just JavaScript development and gives you all of the benefits of JavaScript developers. Now, you could actually use React Native um, with uh, Angular, but I mean, it's a bit of a it requires a little bit of hacking. So the great thing is that the new solution came out, uh, which uh, you know, during this year, which was native script. Right, and native script is basically the same, gives you the same value proposition, but it, it's customized for Angular. It really works well with Angular. The main idea, though, is really the same. You can you get to script native components uh, in JavaScript. So before us, it was really also exciting opportunity, or to um, we did a demo of. Uh, and, and uh, of a uh, React uh, to native script application uh, at NGConf last year was there for uh, Kiva, a nonprofit, and uh, it really worked quite well. And so we recommend everyone to have a look at uh, native script because it really uh, brings you kind of the best of both worlds between native and uh, native development and JavaScript. So more fun stuff, so I'll just mention briefly. Um, I mean, Angular Universal, that's being sort of a great project that allows you to render on the server side. Uh, we see that as kind of becoming really big over the course of the next uh, coming month. Uh, Angular CLI is, uh, you know, seems to be just about to hit prime time, and uh, you know, we expect that that's going to also really uh, transform the efficiency of, of Angular 2 development. So we're really looking forward to that. And uh, I guess it, like a personally a big surprise this year for me was getting a kiss from Shai Resnick at uh, NGCon. I don't know if you have heard of Shai Resnick before, but he's uh, been giving great, great, outstanding talks at, um, at, 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 at Angular Conference. It was uh, quite something. So um, before we wrap up the surprises, the last piece has, I want to talk about was a few words on CSS, because one thing was kind of a bit of a surprise for us. But we found that uh, Angular 
two kind of requires you, or the component are, uh, oriented architecture kind of requires you to think differently about CSS. And this actually is the same, this applies in the same way to Angular 2 and to React. So when, when we got started on our Angular 2 efforts, we were actually sort of in the middle of a short love affair, short but intense love affair with uh, BAM. And BAM is that block element modifier syntax. It's a way of organizing your CSS sort of into components. So you can basically say, here's classes that modify, here's CSS for your certain blocks, and here's CSS for some smaller elements. And it's basically kind of, it's a similar idea to what I've talked about with components, but for CSS. And it's an approach that works really well when you are trying to write CSS for a fairly massive, like, chunk of HTML, which is like really a, just a, a humongous site, or maybe where you are writing Angular 1 and kind of making humongous templates. But as we started breaking down with like taking the component-oriented approach seriously and really, really, really breaking our uh, code down into um, components, it started becoming a little bit awkward because you sort of have those two hierarchies and they need to stay aligned. And, and a lot of people at that point really started looking very closely into direct styling. Right? Like, and this is, this, this is really popular today in React, and this is uh, definitely an option to do in uh, Angular with ng-style. And so the idea is that you basically don't write much in terms of CSS files. And instead, in your component, you specify your style right there. And where in the past you might have been computing your styles uh, using something like SAS, uh, here you can actually just compute those values using JavaScript and um, you know, just set them there. And this is not a bad approach, and this approach is really popular with, uh, with React in particular. The downside of, of this approach is that it's kind of hard to do it consistently because let's say that I mean, you want to pick a particular, you want to style your component with a particular color, but now you really want to, you're going to go ahead and set that color directly using the color attribute and using, say, ng style. But then you have another component that needs to use the same color. So now you kind of need to introduce constants and the, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. So one of approach that we've actually really came to like is uh, microclasses and bad CSS. And the idea of microclasses is really that you come up with uh, you use you do styling through a series of really small special purpose non semantic classes that really kind of wrap up certain basic elements of formatting and then and then you go so like for instance an example of this would be that you know if we want to have half of our interface to be rendered red and half of our interface we want to be rendered purple we may just define those specific values as microclasses. And then inside of our uh, components, we do direct styling, almost direct styling, but we do it with microclasses rather than by setting raw uh, style values. And this actually makes it a lot, a lot easier for you to, uh, to kind of strike a balance between developers really having control uh, between that, like choosing the values, like you're know, doing the conditions in the element based on the element state, and at the same time, uh, really having uniformity in terms of like once you pick the color, then this color is used uniformly, and once you pick your typographic scale, then you can actually stick to that typographic scale fairly consistently rather than having every component sort of pick its own font size and then come up with something that looks ugly. So having said all of this, let me close with a few words on how do you get started on with Angular 2. So, if you are doing Greenfield Angular 2, then getting started is actually fairly easy. I mean, we've been able to upload, uh, uh, onboard uh, developers uh, to Angular 2 very quickly. I mean, a lot of, obviously, there's not a lot of developers out there that you can hire uh, today that have lots of Angular 2 experience, but we'll, you know, we've been managing to train ours very quickly. Uh, the, the first thing that you probably should be doing as you get ready for Angular 2 is really learn ES6 and TypeScript, right? You could, in theory, use Angular 2 without ES6 and TypeScript, but you miss out on a lot of tooling. And it's and also, it just I mean, ES6 provides such better developer experience than ES5 that really do yourself a favor and learn ES6 and TypeScript uh, and use that for Angular 2. So that should probably be your first step. The second piece is that you really want to invest some time in understanding the component model. 
uh, because if you are kind of trying to do Angular 2 without understanding the component model, then everything may seem kind of weird. Uh, but on the flip side, once you get the component model, then you go, you come to Angular 2 and everything makes sense. It's like it's like that. The reason Angular 2 is the way it is is because it's trying to allow you to do component-oriented uh, development. So it really spends some time getting that. Uh, and um, also adopt Redux or NGRX. Again, you know, I'm not going to talk today about pros and cons of, of of those two approaches, but the two of them are actually very very similar to a point where when you look at Redux or NGRX code, you may not always easily be able to tell which one it is. So uh, either one will give you vast, vast uh, improvement uh, in architecture. So then um, use our book. So we've, uh, in, in, as we've been preparing training, uh, uh, we've sort of incidentally wrote uh, an Angular 2 book. And this uh, book has actually become quite popular. Lots of people are using it. We uh, recommend this uh, very broadly. We've invested quite a bit uh, of time recently really polishing it up. Uh, you could go to this URL, or you could just Google for Angular 2 book, and we have a second non-sponsored link uh, that you'll find. And uh, also, we just just to mention, we offer training and consulting, and if you need that, then you get in touch with us, and we'll see what we can offer you. Oh, and then finally, um, look into using Augury. I mean, this is a tool that we've been really excited about uh, contributing to the community. Uh, we are using it internally, and we really... Uh, uh, it really helps you understand the structure of your application. Just Google for Augury and you will be the, one of the first links. Or Google for Angular Augury will be the first link. Uh, give it a try, and especially as you look at your own application, you'll find it a lot easier to understand how your application works. It's really like an extra a machine into your application. And uh, now, what if you're moving from Angular 1 to Angular 2? Well, I'll just outline the steps very briefly. Um, the first step is you will probably want to refactor your Angular 1 code to better Angular 1 code. And the reason for this is because the efforts of migrating Angular 1 to Angular 2 really, really, really depend on Angular 1, on what kind of Angular 1 code you are looking about. I mean, there's, there's Angular 1 code out there that's basically hopeless, but there's also Angular 1, a way of, of developing Angular 1 that actually makes it um, where transitioning it to Angular 2 is actually going to be a snap. So you want to probably start by thinking about whether you should be uh, in transitioning your Angular 1 code to Angular 2, which allows you to front load a lot of work without necessarily having to run the risk of kind of running in a hybrid mode. Now, and this includes adopting the component model. Like you really want to adopt uh, the component model because that's what your Angular 2 development is going to be all about. But you could do a lot of that with some discipline with Angular 1, in particular using component directives. And uh, and you really should start using ES6. I mean, start using ES6 with uh, your Angular 1 project. Right? There's, there's really no reason whatsoever for you to wait on that. Right? If, if you feel like you're not ready to move to Angular 2, well, at least get started on those things. Right? Get started on moving to uh, uh, refactoring your, your Angular 1, writing, making sure that you have awesome uh, unit test coverage and uh, implementing the component model and adopting TypeScript. Actually, adopting TypeScript really should be a first step. And uh, and also, I mean, adopt Redux. And we're actually kind of looking into what it would take to work with, uh, to make NGRX work with Angular 1. But Redux works with uh, Angular 1 with no problems. And then you could sort of carry this into your later project. And, and if you later decide that you want NGRX, again, uh, the overlap between Redux and NGRX is actually quite massive. So uh, Switching to Redux now will actually be a good step towards uh, adopting NGRX later if that's what you decide to do. Now, your step two is, re is really when you start really sort of using Angular 2, right? Um, you would usually probably want to do it bottom up, right? So you would start by writing Angular 2 components, uh, probably in the fairly small ones, right? Think, think about those date pickers and those select boxes and those kind of things. And then you would want to integrate them into your existing application uh, using um, ng upgrade. And and again, while you could work either way, uh, it's easier to work bottom up. It's easier to integrate Angular 2 components into Angular 1 application than to do the other way around, uh, primarily because it's actually uh, you know your Angular 1 application will need your Angular 1 components really need to be sort of done the right way in order for them to 
coexist to be able to survive inside of the regular two application. So bottom up is a bit easier. So, and if you need any help with any of that, then you know, as Rangleo, we provide uh, we consult, provide consulting on transition strategies. Uh, we provide training for Angular One, Angular Two, Angular One written in anticipation of Angular Two, uh, and we also do joint uh, project teams which support knowledge transfer. So that way, your teams working together with us can actually uh, really learn from uh, can transfer the knowledge that our teams have. And we have lots of developers who've been working on. Uh, on Angular 2 literally for over a year at this point. Uh, and as I've mentioned, pretty much all of, I mean, apart from our developers working on React, almost all of our developers at this point are actually working on Angular 2. Uh, coming in October, we expect to have a total of two people uh, working on Angular 1 projects. Uh, so email training at Angular.io, follow us on Twitter, and I'm going to switch to start looking at questions now. What kind of application size and speed difference have you seen between Angular 1 and Angular 2? Um, I think the short answer is massive. We haven't necessarily gone in most cases and really tried to just sort of capture this with numbers, but uh, the answer is huge. No, but what I would, uh, and in particular what we've been finding is uh, even comparing, I mean comparing Angular 1 and Angular 2, I mean it's, it's not really much of a competition. Uh, but what's more interesting is we've been finding that for many applications, um, Angular 2 actually beats React. And that's, that's actually kind of a more interesting thing because, I mean, when React came, uh, you know, came out, and, and, you know, a lot of people were really excited about React because it was so snappy uh, because of virtual DOM, right? Uh, and we've been finding that Angular 2 applications can do actually better than that. Now, the thing that's worth mentioning, though, and worth reiterating, is that it's not really just any Angular 2 application. It's Angular 2 applications that properly utilize change detection strategies. Right? And, and utilizing change detection strategies really means working with sort of more immutable data structures and basically using, in particular, on push change detection strategy where your component is not going to be keep looking inside of a data structure that is provided, but it's going to be expecting that if something changes, it's going to get an entirely new object. And this really, really, I mean, now that speeds up things massively. I mean, we've had um, applications that we worked at where, you know, there's, you know, there's a massive object that's being provided into the component. Uh, the application is very, very sluggish. You can, like, literally wait between typing and then you turn on on push change detection and boom, problem gone. So the difference is pretty huge. Um, there's a question of whether we can use Angular 2 in mean stack. Now, I'm not quite sure what that question really means because, I mean, well, if you're using uh, Angular 2 with, uh, with Node then, and Express, then that sort of mean stack kind of by definition. Uh, I guess if you mean by mean stack, in a sort of mean stack, like mean.io sort of sense. Um, we haven't really been using those projects much. Uh, all of the projects that we've done, usually we have uh, worked with our own starters, speaking of which we actually have, uh, one of the really easy ways of getting started on Angular 2 is uh, we have a starter project for a few different stacks, including Angular 2, and we have one, uh, Angular 2 with Redux. And, and, and the idea is that you, you, you get that starter and you really have all of the basics set up, and in particular, you have all the tooling set up, and you have um, Webpack set up proper, and you've got unit tests, uh, you know, all of those things work. So we actually recommend, when you're new, give a try to one of our starter projects, in particular our, if you go to our uh, GitHub page, it's uh, github.com slash wrangle, you will find there our um, Angular starter. So we've been using those projects to start our projects, and then we also have a full stack um, uh, we actually, you know, more recently, we've been taking an approach of doing two separate repos for uh, server and the client, uh, and so we have a node starter also. Uh, so we do a lot of mean stack in the broad sense, in the sense that it's Angular and combined with Node and Express. Uh, but so in that sense, yes, absolutely, you can use it. Oh, questions showed up now. Okay. 
What about application size specifically? Uh, I guess this is a follow-up to the question of, uh, you know, I think it's not so much the application size, right, that, that kills you with Angular 1. Uh, it's the data size and the sort of the amount of, uh, like it's not the amount of code, right, it's the amount of uh, data that you have mapped onto components, right? So, I mean, it's things like, uh, like grids, right? Like the example that I mentioned where there was just a massive, massive change uh, from just simply switching to a uh, to ng push. It was it was an example uh, where it was an application where there was a grid involved, right? So there's a grid and there's lots of data coming in as input to that grid and then basically it grid the guys to kind of watch that data set structure and, and update everything underneath when really nothing had actually changed and it's become very painful. Uh, if you switch to on, so, so yes, obviously the larger the size of your data and the number of components on the page, the more of an impact you will see. Uh, but I would say even with relatively small examples, we've seen, um, you know, uh, one of our developers, Michael Bennett, has an example where there is a, a, a Tetris application that runs in React, Angular 1, Angular 2 mode, and you could see the difference there right away, uh, both with, uh, in particular, including the difference from Angular 2 to, from React to Angular 2. So do I think, so, do, the question, next question is, do you think subsequent versions of Angular 2 will introduce breaking changes? Since the Angular 2 release candidates have introduced so many breaking changes, which is not typical of a release candidate. So I do not have a crystal ball that would allow me to answer this question. Um, I would like to think that part of the reason that we've seen so many breaking changes in the last few months is because the Angular team has really tried to kind of nail it down uh, so that they don't need to be kind of making as many changes. They really kind of want to come up with something that's really, really solid. Uh, our, just looking at Angular 1 code, it, to us, it looks like it really is built to last. Uh, like it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's being, there's been a lot of breaking changes, but it's been really improvements to design. And in that sense, we're hoping it's going to become more stable at this point. Uh, but you know, I feel like the changes that has happened have been worth it. How about using services with components? Would it be similar like Angular 1.x or something better we can do? So you could... I guess, it, so services are a funny thing because in Angular 1, we've used services for kind of a few different reasons, right? And it's worth really thinking about those cases separately, right? So one reason we used services in Angular 1 is because we've actually needed singletons that are shared throughout application. And the second reason we've used services uh, in Angular 1 is because we didn't actually have any good way of packaging functionality uh, in JavaScript at the time. So now, now that we switch to Angular, uh, as we switch to uh, ES6, we have the module system. The module system really gives us a great way of packaging stateless functions. Right? So, so if you wrote a bunch of code that sort of logically fits together, and uh, you should consider pack, and it's stateless, right? It's not like it's, it's it's just something that like it's a bunch of utility functions. Uh, then you should really package that code as an ES6 module, and it has really little business being an Angular service, right? So in that sense, I would say the vast majority of things that would have been your services in Angular 1 might now actually just simply become ES6 modules. Now, you would, now why would you still, would you still want uh, your kind of singleton um, services, the services that really kind of are used for sharing data between the application. So it's a trickier one because a lot of the use of that was in the Angular 1 was for application state. Right? This was a kind of a more sane way of managing your application state than using dollar scope. Right? So we kind of said, well, dollar scope is bad, using services is good. Now our take on this now is that, well, using services is better but using Flux architecture, in particular Redux or IGRX, is better yet. So uh, now if you're using Flux architecture, you would actually be using, uh, I mean, your store will become a service, right? You'll bring it into your components as, uh, through dependency injection. 
but you probably don't want to be introducing tons of ad hoc services, right? So I would say that yes, you would still be using service occasionally in Angular 1, in Angular 2, but you should be thinking about using uh, ES6 modules a lot more, and you should be thinking about using Flux architecture where most of your state is going to be managed through that. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar, and uh, best of luck with you uh, with your uh, experimentation with um, Angular 2. Again, uh, use our book, and uh, if you need any help, contact us for your training and consulting needs. Thank you very much.